Jackson and Perkins, committed to home garden excellence since 1872. I'm Penelope Hobhuis, and I'm here at the invitation of Jackson and Perkins to look at roses and to look at the different ways you can grow them. I love growing roses with other plants. I think that's very important to me. I like growing roses romantically through apple trees. I like them sprawling over the ground, but I love them almost best, I think, with what I call companion planting, which is putting in lots of bulbs and perennials to grow around their feet. In my own garden, that's what I do, and there's some wonderful examples here of not only roses growing above other plants and through them, but clematis growing through roses, and all sorts of very good ideas. So that's really the secret of, I think, making a garden and using roses as well as you possibly can. Some people would call it cottage gardening. It's a nice jumble, but you combine the roses with plants with contrasting leaves like irises or tall spiky foxgloves and the whole combination is like an English cottage garden but it really works. It is the seemingly haphazard quality of the planting which has led to modern garden style being called cottage garden. At Chilcombe, the tall cranberry flowers like a white cloud. On the pergola, pink roses are accompanied by feathery fennel and spikes of foxgloves with hardy geraniums growing underneath. Apart from the rose, these plants are rampant self-seeders and at Chilcombe are encouraged to look as if they've arrived in their position accidentally. Of course, this cottage garden style planting really works with companion roses. They are either on walls or trellis or pergolas behind and above these cottage garden plants. When you think about growing roses, you don't think only about growing roses in flower beds. You think about growing roses as climbers on walls. This is a rose called Zephyrin Druin, and it's rather a remarkable rose because you can either use it as a shrub, growing it in a flower bed, or you can grow it on a wall, and it has no thorns. It's almost the only completely thornless rose. But here you see it growing on a wall but with a companion plant, a wonderful dark-flowered clematis, one of the Jack Manii sort. And the colours go beautifully together, and you can see the rose stretching right back. And because flowers really basically are very seldom pure hues, here there's a wonderful tinge of blue in all these flowers. We have a very distinct blue pigment in the mauve, and here a deeper blue in the almost violet colour. And actually, if you look around, you see the sweet pea that's got exactly the same colour. So this has been a very carefully posed picture using all these different shades of mauve with the blue, which makes it so effective. And when you're planning for colour in the garden, you should think not only about the greens, which of course are the foliage background to almost all your flower colour, but think about the walls and the walkways.
All of these make a difference to how your color planning works out. Sometimes it's nice to use just a single palette of color, just in one corner like this. Here we have a peach-colored verbascum, slightly paler, almost apricot foxglove. And this whole area is backed by a pink brick wall with another apricot-colored rose on it. In the yellow border at Hadspen, roses are used to give extra structure in the color scheme. Of course the border is not entirely of yellow flowers. In reality, it is filled with lime green, acid yellow, gray and silver and green leaves. And the overall effect is greenery with yellow incidence. Yellow in its pure form is the palest and coolest color. Warm it up with orange and add adjacent reds and it becomes hot. But in this border, it's used in the coolest sense. It catches the eye and advances, giving the same effect as patches of sunlight, particularly with the silvery and grey foliage to set it off and link the spots of yellow together. In one place in the Hadsman border, golden hop leaves, feathery bronze fennels, Jerusalem sage and alcamillas all weave together with yellow roses in the background. And even the yellow roses are really creamy yellow, not pure yellow. In any yellow border, a dash of blue will help the yellows to shimmer, but don't use too much. I think it's interesting to think about colour in the garden, but learning colour theory as an artist would is not all that much help to you, because in gardening, colours are very rarely pure hues. Each flower or leaf has itself many different shades and tones depending on the light, the season, the time of day and its age. Look at how a white iceberg rose varies in colour from the creamy bud and centres to the translucent outer petals. Are they creamy or even slightly pink tinted? Place the rose bloom next to a blue geranium and the white seems whiter and brighter. Look at the detail of the flower of this hardy crane's bill and notice the markings there to attract pollinating insects but with color variations difficult to define or give a color label. Most leaves, the dull colors in a garden scene, are shades of green or gray, silver or even dark or sometimes mysterious purple. But texture of leaves is important too. Glossy leaves reflect light, hairy gray leaves absorb it with silver foliage giving out a shine. Silvery eryngiums with metallic flowers and leaves indicate that the plant comes from a hot, dry climate and the leaves are able to withstand hot sun. This is one called Miss Wilmot's Ghost, which seeds very prolifically. It will grow happily in a well-drained soil. Sometimes it's rather nice to have something with a little bit more contrast and the eye needs the excitement of something bright to make the paler colours actually more interesting. So here we have a bright red rose behind these spikes and that just gives you that extra interest and excitement and I think you can use colour in that way as a surprise, as an excitement. Flowers never exist in isolation, and each flower colour, whether a tint, which is the paler version of the hue, a shade, the darker version of a primary colour, or tone, a more muted version, each will be affected by colours next to it. Of course the colours are not really altered, it is how you perceive them that is changed. I believe that you should learn some colour book theory just like a grammar, and then put it in the back of your mind. It is like eating or reading or speaking. Allow it to filter through if you are planning a major color scheme. You can work on automatic pilot. You'll know what will work with what and will be able to estimate the effects colors have on each other. 
Blues and yellows are complementary colours, as different as possible from each other, and opposites on the colour wheel. Blue or violet is the deepest colour of all, misty in daytime, fading quickly at night. Yellow is standing out like a beacon in the dusk. Place blue and yellow together, and they will both appear brighter. The eye perceives them as differently as possible. Use greys to connect and link your border compositions, but remember that they will make the adjacent colour brighter and more glowing. At Hadsman in Somerset, bronze leaves link the border scheme. Bronze New Zealand flax and dark poppies blend together. In a nearby scheme, dark atriplex, the purple-leaved form of common aurac, blend with red sweet williams with wine-stained leaves. These strong reds can look garish in our English light, but in the strong Californian sunlight look harmonious. I'm in John and Leslie Jenkins' garden at Woolerton Old Hall in Shropshire, and this is not a very old garden, although the house dates back to the 16th century. I'm walking down the really amazing border of shrub roses and perennials and they really know how to grow these perennials with the roses to set off the roses and also to cover the bare earth underneath the stems that the roses come up. We have masses of peonies, masses of cranesbill geraniums, this is one called Magnificum. Um, here we have a peony which is double and white, very scented. It's called the Duchesse de Nemour. This is a very windy, blustery day, and you can see the peonies have had their heads bashed about, really, almost by the rainstorm. But the Jenkinses have very cleverly staked these plants with almost invisible twigs, so the heavy heads are held up and don't collapse. This is another cranesbill geranium. This is called the Meadow. Crane's bill, and it comes in all sorts of different colours. This has got beautiful veined petals, but there are also double forms and darker blues and even almost white ones. All the perennials in these borders are rather muted colours. They, they don't try and attract attention away from the roses. Instead, all the colours weave together. Some of these ground cover perennials we've been looking at really will grow in shade, but these old-fashioned pinks, the dianthus, really need a lot of sun, and they spill out over the edge of the brick. I love this, informal planting in a very structured, formal pattern. More roses, a sage, salvia officinalis, that you do actually use for cooking, but this is the purple-leafed form, and as we come to the end of this walk, this is one of my favourite perennials. This is the white form of the rather invasive flame weed. Actually, it's called Epilobium angustifolium album. And what is beautiful about it is that as the buds begin to form, and just before they come out, they're pale green, and then open to this almost pure white, and afterwards they're covered with white seed heads which float away in the wind. And then that is set off by silver-leaved Annapolis. It really makes a beautiful picture. This is the flower garden. In this border, rather differently from the one we looked at with roses and perennials, there are very few roses, but the roses march down the sides almost in a formal rhythm, giving structure to the garden. A lot of the perennials are in very nice pale misty colours, which go well with most of the roses too. White valerian, pink valerian, and a slightly small salmon red. Silver-leafed artemisias, tall hollyhocks, blue salvias, and this beautiful burning bush, which comes in purple and white forms. It's volatile. If you strike a match here, it will burn, and it has a most delicious smell. It leaves it on your hands. It's really an oil. Yellow argyranthums, daisy bush, more white valerian and a repetition of the Artemisia. I think the Jenkinses like to repeat everything at least once in a border. And the, finally, the border is framed by two dark flowered roses. This is Rose de Rest and underplanted with silver stachys, which sets off the deep red but also makes 
a wonderful ending, filling in the earth between the lawn and the paving. Of course, the rose that you choose for your own garden really does depend on your personal choice. And I don't think any garden could really be without roses because they add such a wonderful quality to every person's garden. Always remember in gardening that colors of flowers are particularly ephemeral. Rose blooms probably last as long as any while their neighboring flowers may come and go. Plan your borders for a flowering succession with roses as your fixed point and choose your companion plants for their overall habit of leaf and grace rather than for flower alone. All gardening is a bit experimental. Manipulating color is just another way of trying new ideas and realizing new visions. Don't forget the beauty of seed heads. Look at the beige seeds of Nectar Scordon Siculum. This was once an allium, much easier name to say. It has dangling plum and cream-colored flowers and then forms buff beige seed heads. Grow it next to roses and admire the seed capsules also of Love in the Mist, Nigella Damascena, which are almost as beautiful as the pale blue flower itself. We're at Mossfant Abbey looking at the collection of old roses, but of course it's not just a rose garden, it's a garden full of other plants, all of which make wonderful companions. They use the roses with a lot of perennials, sometimes low-growing perennials that you see flowering almost before the roses start. And then later, perennials that come right up and if you plan to work with your companion planting in rose gardening, you can make the seasons very much expand because you have early flowering plants and then late flowering plants like the grey lychnis with white flowers. We have blue salvias, we have linaria, we have spiky irises and tall white foxgloves, all of which contrast with the flowering roses. So the roses may, the iris themselves are over, but the leaves, of course, still give you contrast. The whole thing is very, very carefully planned, but for this very gentle assembly of plants. Nothing is too formal. We have sprawling shapes contrasting with these taller spikes. And above all, just roses and scent. And it's really wonderful. I like it very, very much indeed. And I think that it's really the way to grow roses today. Try and mix all these things together and get your muted colors into these wonderful harmonies. Companion plants for roses have understated colors. They harmonize with the rich pinks and mauves of old roses or set off and complement the petals of the newer rose hybrids, which are often brighter orange, yellow, or even scarlet flowers. Companion planting is all about harmonies, seldom about harsh contrasts. Lavender, really a shrub, not a perennial, is one of the most beautiful plants to grow with roses. Lavender hedges flowering in mid to late summer accompany all rose colors and at the same time hide the base of the roses, usually their least attractive part. A lot of these perennials are plants that what we call self-seed. They just send up volunteers all round and that helps get this very natural look which Mottisfant is so well known for. Clumps of white lychnis spring up between the rose bushes with silvery leaves and also being a prolific cedar, lychnis comes in all sorts of colors from red to magenta, pink to white. Although really a short-lived perennial, they usually come true from seed. There's no need to grow it specially, just allow it to happen. Do a bit of editing if it comes up where you don't want it or dig up seedlings and place them where you do. Clary sage and its first cousin, Salvia scleria turkistanica, known as the Vatican sage, are both really biennials, but may well survive to flower again another year if you cut off the flower heads before the seed ripens. They are both naturally prolific seeders, and once in your garden, not likely to go away. 
biennials, including these sages, foxgloves, mullions, tall silvery thistles, are amongst the most useful plants to grow between rose bushes. But some plants, really perennials like linaria, behave like annuals and will flower from seed where the seed falls and germinates, but they will grow happily in sunny spots between the roses. They give a garden a relaxed look as they go up through the rose bushes. What I love here is the natural feeling, the cottage garden look with roses and herbaceous stuff, bulbs, everything flowering and flowing together. And I think people don't really always understand that roses are great plants on their own. They have quality as shrubs. They're not only roses that you see bedded out and massed. I love growing roses with other plants. I love them almost best, I think, with lots of bulbs and perennials to go around their feet. As you combine them with other plants, they look wonderful. They just are fantastic plants. They have a class all of their own. We hope you have enjoyed this exclusive Jackson and Perkins video with Penelope Hophouse and that it inspires you to experiment with roses and perennials in your own garden. In our upcoming catalogs, we are featuring new perennial partner combinations and great land gardens to help make your garden planning easy. Call us at 1-800-854-6200 to receive a current catalog. Here's how you can reach us.